a whole season has passed since we were last here, pretty much all of autumn. So it was 20th of August on the last film, and now it's the 21st of November, and winter is starting to arrive, but actually it's been a really mild autumn here. We've had only three frosts, one of minus two, that was the coldest. So plants have mostly carried on growing quite nicely. Light levels here are very low. We're 51 degrees north, the same as say Newfoundland. So that means it, this is unusual, <laughs> unusual sun. I think the cloud's gonna come over in a minute. And often it's cloudy here. So the low light levels mean winter growth is not fast, but plants can often survive because we're a temperate climate. So they don't freeze too hard. And a lot of what you see here will live through the winter, but it just won't produce a huge amount. But through the autumn, it has been good. And over the year as a whole, we've had some really nice results. And I, I actually wrote down the totals of harvest from this area, which is 25 square meters, 270 square feet in the last four years, like 1918, 87 kilos, 2019, 165 kilos, 2020, 112 kilos. And this year so far, 87 kilos. And that's well over 400 kilos, nearly half a ton actually from this area in four years. And it's divided into roughly 12 blocks, not all equal size, but roughly. So three beds, 1.5 meter wide each, and roughly one meter sections in each bed. And from those, I also noticed this here, we have some really nice totals, like uh, now where the spinach is that I underplanted between the tomatoes, the, we had 11 kilos of tomatoes. And despite the not so warm summer here, and late blight on the tomato plants, they were the highest yielding vegetable, partly reflecting how tomatoes are 95% water, so that always gives you more weight. Uh, they're a lovely plant to grow. And then there were 10 kilos of carrots right here from that spring cabbage up to the end. Figure always surprised me. It's just little and often you keep harvesting them. Nine kilos of lettuce grew there where the broccoli are. Eight kilos of salads grew and have grown, dotted around actually really. Seven kilos of beetroot there, six kilos of onions, four kilos of swede. That was last winter. This is the whole year's um, harvest. So the swede were grown 2020, but harvested this spring. And then four kilos of radicchio and four kilos of peas. So just give you an idea of what's already come from here. And then there's everything else <clears throat> still to harvest, including, well, actually lamb's lettuce a lot. This has been ongoing now for a little while from when I started collecting seed from lamb's lettuce two springs ago. And then I let some flower again this spring to collect the seed, which is very easy to do as long as you've got more than say three or four plants for cross-pollination. And this is the result. <laughs> as well as collecting seed, there's always quite a bit that drops. And we found the same thing over there where this year we collected seed of onion, carrot and beetroot. And we've got a lot of seed and there's quite a bit also fell on the ground. So you get a lot of what are called volunteer plants and they spring up wherever and whenever a bit. You can see some germinated earlier, some later. And I've harvested quite a few. The lamb's lettuce, uh, about that size, you cut them and that, that's your harvest. It's, it never grows big like a, like a lettuce. <laughs> it doesn't do like that. It always stays small, but really tasty. The slightly nutty flavor to the leaves and totally winter hardy. They're not killed by frost. You know, you probably go down to minus 20 centigrade and they'll be fine. And so that's very reliable, small, but reliable, enjoyable winter leaf harvest. And these also are frost hardy. Uh, two, three winters ago, I left some out and it went down to about minus seven and they were fine. So we harvest them as and when. You can see the, the lovely biggest one, this variety called uh, Blairil, B-L-A-R-I-L. Sown late July, transplanted just in the last video, uh, late August. and. They <laughs> uh, get smaller as we go towards the hedge, uh, towards the shed. So you can see the, the big ones here. And I think that probably to do with the light level being lower near the shed. Uh, so we'll see in a minute also with the fig tree over there. What you've got around your plot does make a difference to growth in the middle. And these are pretty good. That's still that we've been harvesting uh, quite a bit already. They won't survive the winter. Dill doesn't like going below about minus two centigrade. Whereas the coriander here probably will survive, uh, particularly the one or two plants that are not flowering. Where they flower, they tend not to so much. And then all the rest of this bed is salads, 
for autumn and winter they're like mustards that's green frills mustard red lace it's called and at the end there's a bit of lettuce which i think won't survive because that's coming towards the end of its life we've picked all of these quite a bit the salad rocket here might and we've got nothing to lose we'll just keep keep them there they'll just stay there and we'll see what we pick through the winter and whether they come through to the spring the salad rocket i'm pleased with because it's from home safe seeds so i let quite a few plants again you need you know, like 10, maybe 12 even. Uh, they can grow quite close together, all make their white flowers, collect the seeds. And that was last, this July, I sowed them and that's the result. They were sown in August. The spinach here is not looking brilliant, <laughs> uh, but it's a very hardy variety called Medania, which I'm confident will overwinter, but there's just quite a few holes in the leaves at the moment. And I think it's partly because being under the tomatoes when they started life, they they did get off to quite a slow start and well, we'll see what happens. Whereas the landcress next to them is a very, very hardy winter salad. So I'd be confident that that will go right through till spring. As would these leeks if we don't want to eat them before. So these are multi-sown leeks bandit, which is a pretty winter hardy variety. Dark green leaf, that's always a clue. And they're multi-sown slightly above ground. So planted not too deep a few lambs lettuce growing between them. Uh, we, we'll dive in there just as and when we need them, but I'm not planning to harvest any of these until February, March, just because they're so winter hardy. And although you can eat leeks now, uh, for me, the main value actually is even March, April. Well, we, we've got two different varieties, actually. One is an early leek, and this is the late leek for spring harvest. This is a harvest right now, and I'm gonna pick one actually to show you because radicchio, chicory for radicchio, is not so well understood in the UK. Um, comes from Italy. <laughs> you, I do that, I pull up the root because that would regrow. And if you want that, fair enough. But I actually don't want the regrowth. Oh yeah, here we go. This is what can happen. The, these have been sitting here a little bit too long, really. You can see it's, it's a nice looking heart, but some of the leaves are rotting. However, is normally only on the outside. And if I take one more off, there's just a bit of rot on the edge of that one. Yeah, look at that. Really nice heart or head of radicchio underneath. So all of that is edible. There's about three or 400 grams there, just under a pound of really nice, it's a really firm head or heart. And we actually put these in salad. We cut them up into quarters and, and break them open and, and put them in the salad mix. But they're also very nice roasted with a bit of oil and they're bitter sweet chicory and endive are bitter leaves and i think for that reason they're, they're not so popular but they do deserve to be because they're, there's a lot of flavor underneath that bitterness and when you get a folded in heart like that you get a sweetness from the blanching effect and they store really well so they're a good autumn winter salad at a time when lettuce is not doing much in fact here's an example of pests these Chinese cabbage always makes me smile because they are so susceptible to being eaten when other plants all around them, you know, are doing fine. Uh, the pests just love them. And I don't actually, I think it was a mistake that I put that one there. I think it got in with the tray of kale plants, but it, it, I kept it there, you know, partly to show that. Uh, whereas the kale, this is red Russian, and it's very winter hardy, uh, but also super delicious as a, as a salad leaf. So that's what we're picking it for. Uh, you can see there's a bit of eating going on there, but not too much, it, pretty clean, no treatment on this. And at the moment we don't have pigeons, so we would cover this with bird netting if, if they come in the middle of winter, but at the moment we don't need to. And we're, we're taking the outer leaves and eating them raw, but you could cook them as well. So very versatile plant. The chives here that you might remember from previous videos, they're going dormant now for winter. I mean, they look a bit sad, but that's nothing to worry about. It's just how they are through the winter months. And then, you know, I could just tidy all this up and then we'll start again in the spring with a clean slate. And I'll even put a bit of compost on there. In fact, I, I aim to put compost on all of these beds once a year. The question is when, because here, for example, uh, I'm racking my brains now, I didn't put any on here since the spring. So the compost here could go on any time. 
under these plants. These are purple sprouting broccoli. Because it's been so mild, they even we've been finding a few caterpillars on them, but not really to do much damage at this time of year. So I'm not doing anything about that. Just squash them if we see them. Uh, I saw one earlier actually. And then just to see, we popped in these bulb fennel between the purple sprouting. I use it as a kind of catch crop pop-in plant because it's quick growing at the end of the season. And they haven't really had enough light and that's what's tended to draw them up, but there's still some food there. So it was worth doing and we'll harvest them over the next week or two before it gets too cold. Here is the, the next generation, <laughs> uh, spring. Thinking of spring, it might not work, but again, I'm trying it. Um, rather like, I forgot to mention actually, the, you might remember in the last video, I transplanted some cumin there. That didn't work, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Uh, it was the wrong time of year. I had a feeling it might be. It, it, to grow cumin, I'm going to try again to sow it in the spring. It grows like a carrot and then flowers the following year to make its cumin flowers and seed. These peas that we planted here just a week ago, they followed chicory that I'd finished. And I spread a bucket full of compost. So that's why I brought this out to show you. This is homemade compost, about a year old now. And you can see quite a high proportion of, well, no, quite a few bits of wood. I wouldn't say it's a massive amount of wood, but the wood's visible just because it's big pieces and hasn't decomposed as fast as the rest of it. There's a lot of lovely fine compost as well there. But the, the wood I do value, when it's on the surface, it carries on decomposing without interfering with plant growth. It's not in the rooting zone. And you start to see lovely fungal threads on the surface, even in the soil a bit. Uh, so in some places, <laughs> make some of the soil sometimes quite white. And that is, uh, for me, that's a healthy sign. And I think sometimes, if you don't know about that, people worry about fungi growing mushrooms. It, you know, if you see anything like that, just be happy it's, it's wood decaying, woody material decaying in a totally natural way. And those mycelial fragments that are in the soil or near your roots, often they're helping your plants to grow if they're mycorrhizal. It's not obvious to the naked eye, well, partly because you can't actually see mycorrhizal mycelia, as far as I'm aware anyway. And that means you can't be sure that you've got them. But I would say that most of what's growing here is linked into some kind of mycorrhizal network. People say that brassicas don't use that way, the, the mycelial fragments to, to grow, but personally I think they do because we've seen stronger growth of brassicas on my nodig bed, my two trial beds, where you would think if, if the mycelia were not involved then the growth would be stronger on the dig bed maybe or there wouldn't be much difference, but generally the nodig is stronger uh, for brassicas. You can see how healthy these ones are looking here, uh, but all of these, all of this garden will definitely have a lot of <laughs> fungus going on in the soil underneath and these plants are almost certainly talking to each other and helping each other sometimes like you know they're interplanting there the fennel and the broccoli for example. So we spread the compost there about one bucket full and then I dipped holes popped in these pea plants. The endive here I'm growing in two different ways so some that we've been picking the outer leaves and a few I left to grow into hearting endive and they were here last time in August they've been here quite a long time and they resisted the slugs the best in summer they're really hardy plants and when you get into the heart there, there's some quite nice tender slightly blanched leaves so really good value for this time of year going into late autumn early winter the sorrel is not really going to grow much in the winter that's starting to look pretty sad now not enough light more than anything and it's looking eaten that's just because it's a bit weak whereas the tree kale, the perennial kale, wow, really healthy, strong. I pruned it hard in July, that, that really paid off, or in June actually. And this will keep producing, so I take off the outer leaves like that. And it doesn't matter, there's a few holes in that, you know, there's nice kale to eat, not the stem, but the leaf more. And finally, I'll mention the fig because <laughs> it's been lurking here all the time that we've been filming these small garden videos and I've never said much about it and it, it's been quite small but the last two years it's really grown I think from more summer rain we've had starting to notice when I dip holes for those peas there are quite a lot of fig roots in there it's not good if you've got big trees tall hedges close to your 
plot because it's not so much the light, although it's partly that, uh, but it's the roots taking moisture, particularly in the summer. That's, that's a big factor. And it'll help that I shall prune that fig pretty hard this winter. I found a good video on YouTube about how to prune fig. <laughs> I'm still learning that one. And I'll put the link in the video description so you can get some ideas from that. And uh, it's basically about pruning it really hard and, and knowing which bits to cut out completely. And we'll see what happens next year because what I've been getting is no ripe figs. I get instead uh, ones like this. I've just picked earlier if I can see it. I'll put it down somewhere. Ah, uh, no, it's moved. Um, well, there's one, for example. And it's looking, changed colour a bit. Kind of looks like it might be ripe, but no. <laughs> it's all hard and white and dry inside. It's not sweet or anything. So they're not getting a full season of growth because you need the baby tiny figs to develop before winter and they're the ones that go through the winter and then they shoot into development and new growth in spring, summer and you get ripe figs in our, in our cool climate. Like here, the temperature in the summer rarely goes above 28 centigrade, so our average summer temperature is 21 degrees by day, to give you an idea. And yeah, I hope you've enjoyed having a look around here and it's a bit of a sort of end of year summary and it's also kind of end of four year summary because Edward, my son who's filming today, it was his idea to really get this one going the small garden and we started, we had a lovely <laughs> brief filming in September 2017, uh, four, four more years ago. And uh, ever since then we've been filming at least seasonally here. Uh, there's a whole catalogue of these that you can find on both on YouTube and we've also put them in to retrieve the packages that we're selling there because they then go in with lots of um, AI to help you find information and different things growing. Uh, so we put a whole sequence of small garden videos in there. Again, I'll put the link in the description. And I'll say thank you to Edward for all his help and work doing this. It's been a great project so far, and we're gonna carry on uh, filming next spring with Alessandro, Spicy Moustache, who's also helping now to film for this channel. <laughs>